Okay, hi everybody. Hey. All right, welcome to the uh, Drupal NYC meetup, uh, September edition. Um, as we've been uh, noting, this is our first meetup here in our, our brand new space here at 30 Rock, which is fantastic. Uh, I am Alex Ross. I will be your MC for the evening. Um, hopefully, I don't have to stretch any more than I already have, because that doesn't go well. Um, but we have a lot of really good things going on. I'm going to just go over some housekeeping things pretty quick, um, just to let you guys know what's going to happen today. Uh, let you know what we're going to be, uh, what we're going to be hearing, and, and how this meeting will go, how future meetings might go. Uh, introduce some people, and uh, and we'll go from there. So we've already done agenda item number one. Um, we've socialized. Did everybody say hello to someone next to you? Everyone? Yeah? Socialize, right? Uh, we'll do more socializing later. Um, and we've had pizza, so rockin'. There's still a couple slices in the back. Um, so right now I'm going to go through a bunch of announcements. After that, we have some introductions to make. Um, Slight variation from our normal format. Uh, today's event, we're going to be doing, uh, I think it's seven, six or seven uh, lightning talks. Eight? Are we up to eight? We have eight lightning talks. Um, so our, ti our typical... Something just... Okay. Our typical format, uh, for those who haven't been to a New York City meetup, is uh, we typically have uh, two to three lightning talks, which are maybe five to ten minutes on a very specific topic, uh, a quick demo, a quick POC of something. And then we have uh, one or two uh, more in-depth talks. Uh, that's a format that we will be going back to in the future. But for this meetup, we wanted to um, mix it up a little bit and, and get it, give as many people as we could an opportunity to uh, go over something interesting. So we're going to have some lightning talks today. Um, after that, we'll have some closing remarks. Um, and um, and then everybody can come to Bill's Bar, which is on 51st Street. You can enter through downstairs. Um, in the concourse, or you can enter through the street. But I believe we will all be meeting in the downstairs area of Bill's Bar, the concourse level area. So make sure you go down. Um, so that's our, our agenda for the evening, and, uh, and we'll try and get started. Um, so the lightning talks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, a, an introduction to each person as they're going to come up. But uh, here's a, a quick rundown of who's going to be speaking and what they're going to be talking about. Uh, the future is here. Uh, what's Drupal got to do with it? By um, Ben Mallinson. It will be our first one, and I'll go through the rest as we go. But we got some very exciting talks. Um, after that, uh, oh, some introductions. So uh, these are your organizers for the evening. I'm just going to go real quick. The people who, when I call your name, just wave your hand so everybody can see you. Oh, I want, I want oh. everybody to come up real quick. Okay. Yeah. Right. Elijah's trying really hard to orchestrate this in a very particular way. Um, is, is this like the candle lighting at a bar mitzvah where everybody comes up and... No? I don't do... Yeah, I do. That's true. All right. The organizers are coming up. So we have uh, me. I'm Alex Ross. I'm your MC. Ben Jevons, who's been organizing our speakers. Uh, Elijah Lynn, who has been uh, organizing all of this. Uh, Forrest Mars. We're over here. Forrest Mars. Uh, Ho Ling Poon. Um, my... I don't remember how to say your last name. Yuri? Irie? Yeah, I was so close. And Chris Brandau. So this is everybody. These are your organizers. Um, hi, everybody. Woo! Yay! Um, yeah, Elijah really wanted everybody in the video, so right now you can see that, that only half of the people are actually in the video, uh, if you look behind you there. Um, so everybody wave at the out-of-focus camera. There it is. Very, very out-of-focus. And... Uh, there you go. Okay, those are your event organizers for the evening. Um, in general, if anybody ever has any questions or uh, ideas for how to uh, improve our, our events or, or do something different or something fun, um, make sure that you... Uh-oh, we spilled. Um, make sure that you contact one of these people. Um, also, at the bottom of the screen, for those of you who need it, there's information about the Wi-Fi. Um, so pay attention to that if you need to get on the Wi-Fi. Ooh, I'm in focus now. Huzzah. Um, okay. Moving on, uh, a couple just thank yous. Uh, first off, the, the, this venue, this great venue that we're in now, uh, as well as the food and the drinks uh, for tonight, we're sponsored by NBCU Technology. Um, so give, yes, everybody, thank you. Um, so in, in particular, our, our, our talent acquisition group from HR, uh, you know, really wanted to, to meet you guys. And so they, they came up with the cash for the pizza and the beverages. So definitely go out at some point. They're sitting right outside that door in that little table with some swag. Go say thank you for the pizza and drop them your resume. Just 
saying. Um, if anyone's looking for, you know, change. Um, and then we also have um, a quick thank you to Brooklyn Girl Studios, Janine, who's somewhere walking around. There she is. So Janine is, is taking photos tonight. Um, she'll be putting them up somewhere later so we can all see them. Um, I assume on the, it's in the cloud somewhere. Um, but we'll, we'll figure that out. I'm sure that people will, will tweet around how to find those pictures. Um, but thank you to Janine. Everybody should go over and get your picture taken, right? Find a friend. Okay. Um, a couple quick interesting facts. We wanted to do this real fast and we'll do it very fast. Uh, I already asked the percent of tonight's RSVPs that are first timers. It looked to be about three or four percent. So that's cool. Welcome to all our full our first timers or full timers. Welcome to all our first timers. Um, we couldn't remember the year and no one would respond to me on um, the various communication channels. So I've decided that the NYC meetup was founded in 1893. Um, <laughs> A couple other quick facts about 30 Rock. It's, it's just a very cool venue, so we wanted to just give you a little, uh, a little nugget of info here. Uh, that famous photo of everybody having lunch on the beam that was taken while they were constructing this building in 1942. Um, the SNL stage is three, four, three floors down in the uh, back of the building from where we are right now, which is just fun. And I forget what floor it's on, but I have seen this. Um, there's a room somewhere where you open a random closet door and in the closet door You see all these pipes that were painted by Jim Henson while he was bored waiting to go on the Jack Parr show um, Which is just awesome. So, you know, just some fun facts um, I keep wanting to push whoever's computer this is and push the space bar, but that's not how it's going um, Other housekeeping things restrooms uh, Ladies room is on this side men's room is on this side about halfway down the corridor on your either left or right as you walk down the corridor. Um, if you have your mobile phones or other devices that go jingle jangle, please put them on mute. Um, and uh, also, as you might have heard, we're trying to record this. So if you have questions during the event or, um, or I can't think of any other reason other than questions, um, we'll be passing mics around or uh, Elijah or Ben or someone will be kind of in the back So just wave your hand and someone will come over and give you a mic so that anyone who watches the recording can see or can hear what you're saying um, uh, Photos uh, take lots of photos of our events um, upload them to um, Meetup.com slash Drupal NYC and then our official hashtag on all of the various things that have hashtags is uh, pound Drupal NYC very exciting um, What's that? Oh, yeah. If, you're, if you don't want to be in a photo, just sit there like this for the rest of the evening. Um, and, uh, oh, we're going to be recording. Uh, we had a, a, a bunch of equipment, not a bunch, but we had some equipment that we had to purchase as an organization in order to um, make recordings happen, which we've been wanting to do for a very long time. Uh, so uh, special thanks to all of the people on that list for donating some, some dollars so that we can go out and buy that. Um, yay! <laughs> Um, and there's also on this slide, there's a, a bit.ly link to watch this on YouTube. But I bet if you Google it, you could find it. Google, Google knows everything. Tonight's recording, what Elijah wants the, to tell us. The bit.ly link was just for, can this micro, is this microphone working? Yeah. Is, um, the bit.ly link is uh, just to show like the chip-in spreadsheet of the people that kind of all contributed. Oh. So I just put it there for historic purposes. OK, so if you're, if you're interested in studying the list of people who donated. <laughs> Memorizing it, coming back next time and reciting it in order or backwards, then there you go. Um, okay, a couple upcoming events. This is something that we always do at the beginning of all our meetups for those who are new. Um, DrupalCon Barcelona. So uh, DrupalCon, uh, there's one every year in North America. There's one in Europe. Now there's one typically in South America, one in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Barcelona is coming up pretty soon um, in like two weeks, three weeks, September 21st. Um, there's also a little closer to home. There's Baltimore Drupal Camp. So if you're an Orioles fan, you can leave and then go to the Baltimore Drupal Camp on October 9th. Um, New England Drupal Camp, which I'm I, I'm pretty sure is in New Hampshire this year, or is it still in Boston this year? I don't know. Um, but luckily, there's a link for nedcamp.com. Uh, that's coming up in uh, in mid October on the 10th as well. Uh, Drupal Camp Atlanta, October 16th and 17th. Um, head down to Atlanta. Uh, for that one, and then Bad Camp. If any of you have never been to Bad Camp, it's the largest camp that's not a con, typically. Um, Forrest doesn't like when I point that out, but whatever. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Forrest. Um, 
<laughs> so that's in, uh, in the San Francisco area, Bay Area Drupal, bad camp. So if you can uh, make it to any of those, that's terrific. There's always great sessions that go on. There's always sprinting that happens, and you can participate in, in the community itself. You can you know, write some code, learn how to contribute to the, to the community, any of those things. You know, submit a session, speak. Um, if, uh, in general, if anybody has any other upcoming events that they typically want us to put in here, you should make sure you get in contact with one of the organizers, and we will try and include it in the, in the appropriate meetup slide. A um, couple more of these things. Um, oh, interested in speaking. So who here has spoken at any kind of meetup ever? OK. Of all of you who have, who have ra risen your hand, raised your hands, all of you should come up with an idea and give it to Ben as soon as possible. Ben is in the back. Um, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, now is your chance. Um, if you want to give a good talk on some problem that you were having and you figured out a good solution, you uh, came across some interesting module out there and you want to tell the world and shout from the rooftops about it, definitely, definitely, definitely um, let Ben know and we will try and organize that. Additionally, if you were hoping against hope that there would be a talk about a particular topic, then, you know, and you, because you want to learn more about that topic, that is also a great idea to let Ben know. Ben knows a lot of people, and he will help to find someone who is an expert in that particular field or in that particular topic, and, um, and we will do our best to, to accommodate that kind of request. Um, so definitely his contact is, uh, is Jevons at Gmail. It's right there. Or you can just go, you know, talk to him in person. Um, what else do we have? Okay, we're going we're gonna to do introductions. Uh, even though we have a lot of people, but we have a framework for this, all right? Introductions should take five seconds or less. That's right. I cut half the time off from the top of the slide. Um, just what is your name? I am a what is your job title? I work for so-and-so, and I'm here to do such and such. My name is Alex Ross. I am a Drupal developer. I work for NBC Universal. I'm here to uh, stall for time when recordings don't work. Um, so we're going to start over there in, in that corner. And five seconds or less, go. Uh, name is Marcus Dent. I am a business development manager at a company called Job City. I'm here to learn more about the, uh, the tech side of Drupal. I'm Sean Duncan. I'm a technical team lead at FFW, and I'm here to connect with our community. My name is Eugene Estrade. Uh, I'm a developer, and I work for a new startup called Mito Group. I'm here just to connect with the community. Uh, my name is Frank Carey. I'm a entrepreneur and developer. I work for DaVinci, and I'm here to chew bubble gum and uh, present on slides on DaVinci. Uh, my name is Daniel Hanold. I, I am a Drupal developer. I work for DNA Info, and I'm here to meet other Drupal developers. My name's William Wong. I'm a, t a developer technologist. I work as a contractor. I'm here to meet other Drupal developers. Uh, my name is Ron Breyer. I'm a systems analyst. I work for myself, and I'm here to learn. I'm Forrest Mars. I've got my company called The Mars Group doing a Drupal consulting, and I'm here to fix bugs and kick ass, and I'm almost out of bugs to fix. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Elijah Lin. I'm a software engineer at NBC Universal. I'm here to just hang out with you guys, have some fun, and help organize the meetup. Hi there. I'm, my name is J9, and I'm here from Brooklyn Girl Studios to take photos of all you lovely individuals and make you look fabulous, darling. My name is Reiner Keller. I'm a graphic designer and site builder, and I'm here to learn about Drupal. Hi, my name is Mike. I'm in finance, and I'm just here to learn more about Drupal. Hey, my name is Edward. I work for uh, North Point Digital as a developer, and I'm just here to network with other Drupal developers. Hi, I'm Jeannie. I work at Wild Cornell Graduate School. I'm a program coordinator and content manager, and I'm just here to learn pretty much like everyone else. Uh, hi, my name is Eric. Um, I'm a developer. I work for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and I'm here to listen and learn. I'm Dan Flanagan. I work for a network of nonprofits. I'm a project manager and uh, new to Drupal. I'm, my name's Tim Moran. I'm uh, with Bliss Design in Staten Island. Um, and I'm a site developer, and I'm here to uh, eat and drink. Hi, my name is Mukesh. I work with NBC. 
and I'm here because you forced me to come here. Yes. <laughs> he, he's not lying. Hi, my name is Imtiaz. Uh, I'm working uh, NBC. Uh, we support uh, lots of Drupal applications. Hi, my name is Ganesh. I work in NBC Universal, and we work for Drupal operations. My name is E. I also work at NBC Universal. I'm a developer, just seeing what hap what's happening in the community. My name is Mani. I, um, I'm a Drupal developer. I work for Synduit. Um, I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Um, hi, my name is Vinay. Uh, I work as a software engineer at NBC Universal. I'm here to turn from a Drupal noob to a Drupal master. Hi, my name is Supsan Mitter. I am a Drupal developer. I work for NBC, and I'm here to learn something new in Drupal. Uh, my name is Anbarasan. Uh, I'm a Drupal developer. I work for NBC, and I'm here to uh, know like what's going on with Drupal. Steve Harris. I build my own personal websites for art and photography, and I'm here to learn. My name is Holing Poon. I work for the New York Public Library, and I'm here to do my mail with Drupal. Mm -hmm. Uh, hi, Mark. I was looking for items for my bag of tricks. Hi, I'm Dave Johnson. I'm a creative director for digital at Here Media, and I'm here to learn more about Drupal. Hi, my name is Babu Kura. I'm lead software engineer for NBC Universal, so I'm here to get to know more Drupal. My name is Ben Melanson. I'm a developer. I work for Agaric and own Agaric with a bunch of other people. And I am here to uh, talk about the future of Drupal and learn a whole lot from the next talk. Earl Fong, backend developer. Um, I work contracting at Whole Whale in Brooklyn. I'm here to learn more tech stuff, to connect with the community, and to also let people know that I'm looking for additional part-time work. Andrew Consilio, I'm a Drupal developer, and I'm just here to learn a little bit more. My name is Ali. I'm a web developer at uh, United Nations. I'm here to meet with other colleagues. <laughs> My name is Brad Wade. Uh, I'm a Drupal developer, and I work for Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And I'm here to hire a front-end developer. So come talk to me. My name is Ben Horst. I am a product manager, and I work for Bloomberg. And I'm here to connect with the community. Hi, my name is Scott Walpole. <clears throat> I work in analytical, which is my company. Um, I do development and business, business relations. And I'm here to network and learn as always. I guess we're standing now. <laughs> Someone started a trend, we're standing. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Laura Downs Puma. I work at Barnard, Barnard College. I'm a digital strategist and site owner, so I'm here to keep up with people and network. Yeah. Awesome. Mike Myers. VP of Development, uh, De uh, Developer Relations for Acquia. I'm here to talk about uh, Drupal 8 and why you guys should be building sites on Drupal 8 today. And I'm here to say hello to the community. I'm Deirdre Wyeth. I'm a front end developer and um, also content strategist. I'm here to learn. Hi, my name is Joe Imerson. I'm a talent recruiter and I work for Boyle Software. And we're looking for awesome Drupal developers. So come talk to me. Uh, my name is Andre Halipov. I am a Drupal developer. I work for NBC News. People and have fun. Hi, my name is Sergey. I am front end developer at NBC Universal. I'm here to uh, listen talks and meet people. Hey, I'm Chuck Fishman. I'm the director of the media practice at Acquia, and I'm here to help Drupal adoption in the media industry and also with digital agencies that are helping media companies build uh, great digital experiences. So connect with me, please. Hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a solutions architect at Acquia, and I'm here to talk about something else than Drupal. So I'll disappoint you if you want to learn more about Drupal. Hi, my name is Greg Lowenthal. I am a new Acquian, uh, Solutions Architecture in New York area, and uh, I'm new to, new to Drupal, so I'm here to Hi, my name is Matt, Matt Stein. I, I am a human being. 
Um, I'm not a developer. I work for Mount Sinai, and I thought I somehow got disconnected from my tour group, so. <laughs> my name is Nick, uh, and I'm a senior technical specialist. I work for Columbia University, and I'm here to learn more about the Hi, my name is Tony Bellamy. I am a developer. I work for North Point Digital. I'm here to listen and learn. Hi, I'm Philip Denlinger. I'm a site designer. I work for Medimedia, which is a uh, medical publisher. And uh, you all put together a great slate of speakers, and so I'm here to listen. Hi, uh, my name is Carlos Cardo. I am a Drupal developer and architect, and I work for Viacom. And I'm here to network and to learn. Hi, my name is Giovanni Glass. I'm a web developer. I work for NBC Universal, and I'm here to learn. I'm Jeff Vargas. I'm a director of technology for Sci-Fi, and <clears throat> I'm here to try to convince Alex to expense all the drinks tonight at Billy's. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelly. I uh, work for Sci-Fi for NBC Universal, and I'm here to learn. Project manager. Hi, I'm Diego Palma. I'm uh, I'm a front-end web developer. I work at the UN, and I'm here to learn. Hey, I'm Evan Pirro. I'm a developer at uh, Theater Mania, and I'm here to learn more about continuous integration and testing automation. Hello, my name is Moshe Lachter. I'm a graphic designer, and I'm here to become less confused about Drupal. Hi, my name is Kim. Uh, I work at NBC Universal as a Bravo. Um, I'm a developer, and I'm here to connect and learn. Hi, my name is Christina. I work at the new NBC Universal as a Drupal developer. I'm here for meeting my friends and also learn some new stuff. Hi, my name is Daniela. I uh, work in engagement here at NBC Universal Technology, and I am here to support my team. Hi, my name is Adrian. I am an engineer. I work for Teacher Pay Teachers, and I'm here to network. I'm Phil, and I'm an investor and developer, and I'm here to learn. Uh, my name is Nina Nicholson. I work for the Episcopal Diocese of Newark. Uh, I'm responsible for our diocesan and some church websites in Drupal 6 and 7. I'm here to learn, to meet people, and possibly meet uh, freelance consultants who I might possibly hire to so talk to me, too. Uh, I'm Neil Drum. I work at the Drupal Association on uh, Drupal.org. I'm Jody Hamilton, I'm the CTO of ZivTech, and we're always interested in new clients and new employees who we will convince to leave New York to come to Philadelphia, which is a way better city. <laughs> Hi, my name's John Amatuli, I'm a uh, freelance developer, and uh, I'm here to learn more about Drupal. Um, Hello, my name is uh, Stephen Fox. I'm CEO of uh, Fastport Passport. We're a vital document expediting firm. Uh, we run a lot of uh, passport and visa expediting sites, all built in Drupal. So we're looking for front end and back end developers. So if you're interested, I'm here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rich Von Rauhop. I'm a web strategist and solutions architect at Stony Brook University. I'm here to drink the beer that Alex is going to buy later. <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Burns. I'm an account director at Phase Two, and I'm here to give a lightning talk and to connect with old friends and meet new friends. Hi, I'm Joseph Cheek. I am a Drupal developer at Time. I'm very surprised because we are one block away. We have 60 developers, and I think I'm the only one here. Ooh. I don't know what happened. Anyway, uh, I'm the Drupal developer, <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm really just here for the pizza. I'm William Choi. I'm the lead developer at uh, an award-winning agency called, called um, Inflection Interactive. Hi, I'm Daniel Strum. I'm a site developer, freelance, um, and I'm here because I always pick up something really useful. Uh, are, we, are we miss anyone? Are we good? All right. I think we have a couple more. The, the progress bar of, in, of introductions I'm, uh, is almost uh, at the Willie end. Karam. I'm a developer, and I work at Acquia as a solutions architect. And I'm here to uh, give props to the amazing organizers who put together fantastic nights. 
Thanks, guys. Thank you. My name is Tolly. I um, am a startup advisor slash JavaScript developer. I work for multiple people. And I'm here to remember how PHP works and say hi to a few people. <laughs> Uh, my name is Vanita. I am a Scrum Master um, working for IBM, and I'm here to visit some of my old MC Universal buddies. Hi there, I'm Connor. I'm a manager of software engineering here at NBC Universal, and I'm here to learn. Hi, I'm Eric. I also work at NBC Universal. I'm currently I'm here to swipe my car, so Alex is going to prove it later. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Alex. I'm the CEO of ZipTech. Like Jody, I'm here to tell you that Philly is better. Cable Town will welcome you when we move your jobs to Philly in 2017 when the tech center opens. But for you Visa uh, you know, holders, I want to let you know there are other opportunities in Philly for Visa holders. So that's all I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, come to Philly, and Cable Town is not the best place to work, but we have other great places to work in Philly. So I'm just saying, New York is not all what it's... Chopped up the bit. All right, all right, all right. Enough, enough, enough. Haters gonna hate. Cable Town, Comcast, who doesn't get it? All right, let's keep going so we can uh, go. I'm, I'm Steve. I'm a freelance um, visual designer, and I'm here to learn. All right. Hi, my name's Ollie. Uh, I'm a salesperson and I work for Phase 2 and I'm here to understand what I'm actually selling. Sounds good. All right. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> my name is Sam. Uh, I'm the UI architect for IBM's Watson Group, and I, or Watson Design Group, and I'm here to convince you to not use Drupal. <laughs> I'm going to swing over here, yeah. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Kevin Sweeney. I'm a talent acquisition director uh, here at NBC Universal. Um, oversee uh, technology and our operations and technical services hiring in, uh, in New York City, uh, Angle Cliffs, uh, Colorado, LA, Seattle. Uh, so we cover pretty much coast to coast. Uh, <laughs> No, definitely not Philadelphia. <laughs> you guys, uh, Victor Santos, also a talent acquisition, supporting literally all of our technology initiatives. Love to meet some of you. Stop by right there and back. We got some swag, and you know, um, it looks like a good time. Thank you. I'm Cameron Egans. I'm a senior software engineer at NBC Universal, and I'm in town from Boise, Idaho, to meet everyone from the Drupal user group. Yeah, Boise, Idaho. Uh huh. Boise, right to <laughs> Philly. Uh, I'm Nate Bogusiewski. I am uh, a web manager. I work for Metadata Solutions, and I'm here to learn. Right, there are plenty of chairs. There's chairs over here. All right. Okay, I think that's everyone, and I just want to say I'm really glad that our drinking word for tonight was not learn. <laughs> we would be hammered. Okay, thank you, everybody, for your introductions. <laughs> Woo! That was, that was exciting. That was exciting. Woo! I wasn't sure how it was going to end, but it went well. Um, okay, so as we heard, this is, this is going to take like two seconds, this piece. Raise your hand once more if you are looking to hire someone. Put your hands down. Raise your hand if you are looking to be hired, potentially. All right, everybody take note, right? Look around. Yes. All right, and finally, um, here we go. We're going to get into our lightning talks. First up is Ben uh, Mallinson. He's going to be talking about um, what the future is here, what's Drupal got to do with it. We're going to find out. Um, ben is, um, excuse me, he's the author of the definitive guide to uh, Drupal 7. He is the co-founder of Agaric, and um, he and they work on worker-owned cooperatives, which help people create and use powerful internet technology. He lives and works to connect ideas, resources, and people. I had that all memorized. Um, so Ben, come on up. Hello. Am I live? Can we get the slides from this computer? Yeah, we're working on it. 
<laughs> All right. Oh, man. Future is here. So is Rockefeller Center expect? was built in 1942. <laughs> Future's here. Do not expect technology to actually work. Um, uh, I'm just, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. Fine laptop. All right. Let me explain how this works. Two buttons. This is a good user interface. I will probably not speed this up. What could possibly go wrong? So we're going to hear a lot yeah. about um, some really cool things that Drupal does and some things that Drupal doesn't do. This looks like a really diverse. Um, hmm? Hmm? So Rockefeller Center was built in 19. No, I've taken that. I've taken that to the end. It's just the end of the road. I could do like old George Carlin routines from the 80s. <laughs> I really don't think that would be appropriate. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> I'm curious how they how they made graphics for some of those. <laughs> Yeah. The world famous rock group playing downstairs right now on Jimmy Found the Roots. They're from. They're from Boise. That was pretty scandalous. I'm pretty sure the score of the Mets Phillies game yesterday was pretty awful, so. It's like 19 to 2. Yeah, no. but it's the Mets, so who... Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Forest Mars, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, all right. Okay. So apparently we have problems with Linux and our projector, and that's where we're at. Boo. So here's what we're going to do. We're going uh, to uh, bring up Molly Burns real quick. I, I hope that Molly's still in the room and knows that we're going to bring her up. Um, I don't know where she is, but we're going to... There she is. Hi, Molly. Okay. Um, so... We're getting, her, we're getting her all set up and we're getting her uh, presentation to show up here. Molly has been working with Drupal in solving internet and people-related problems for eight years. She's been a content editor at a small nonprofit, a global website platform manager for one of the earliest corporate Drupal platform and project manager for large Drupal builds. She's currently an account director at phase two. Uh, she has the privilege to work with some awesome clients, excellent teams, and builds awesome that, to build awesome software and find creative solutions to common scenarios introduced by the whole digital transformation that has taken the world by storm these last few years, Molly. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, so, hey everyone. Um, nice to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I think we're good. Are we good? Yes. Okay. You'll be able to see it, I promise. Okay, great. Um, success and connected. And hi, I'm Molly Burns. Um, as Alex said, um, I've been around Drupal for about eight years, and I've been uh, worked on a variety of different. Um, platforms and roles um, and from Drupal 4.7 to now um, and a lot of what I do, um, I haven't touched a line of code, a lot of what I do is 
um, the people work and the coordination and what I like to sort of call the, the dark matter magic, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, so as a lot of you guys probably know, um, Drupal is a big part of the larger shift going on in the web where we've kind of moved from a static system to a dynamic system. And this shift has brought a whole other level of complexity and even also a bunch of new roles that have emerged in this space. Um, people are doing things and doing jobs working with these systems and these dynamic systems. So this is sort of um, the, the space that I inhabit and I'm going to be kind of sharing some tips and some ways in which I've kind of learned to frame things in this space. Um, so kind of continuing on this theme, um, and a lot of what I get, people are like, what do you do? And I'm just like, I do the internet. I work on the internet. It's kind of um, the space in between science and magic where kind of things get done and the non-physical phenomena, the coordination, to solve problems that maybe have never been solved before or need to get solved in a different way. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, dark matter. Um, I don't know if you guys know any astrophysics, but um, this is a term that refers to dark matter that's um, unseen, it's everywhere, and it keeps the universe moving. It's only defined by its interaction um, with other things, so it's kind of hard to put your finger on exactly what it is. You can't like take a picture of it and see it. Um, and so dark matter, it's been proven to be in between our neurons and in our brains, as well as in the larger galactic um, space. And, and I also think it is a part of the fabric of what brings building the internet together. Um, so you can kind of see here, this is a picture of a network modeling of um, people's interactions. Um, and so a lot of the, the dark matter and getting things done in my space is actually the work um, that happens in between people and within systems. Um, so I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people over the years, some of whom are in this room. What up, Stepson? <laughs> um, new faces who I haven't seen in a long time. Um, and a lot of these, um, these networks and connections are actually what um, makes things happen and gets stuff done. Um, so sort of um, you know, managing configurations and doing builds by um, teamwork is a big part of, of that process and um, that kind of internet dark matter that we're all sort of a part of. Um, so we definitely all kind of, when we're working as a team, we get to a situation where there might be a problem. You know, there's a, there's a problem space that comes up. And sometimes um, working through and defining these problems is kind of the first stage to be able to solve them and move forward and to create a solution. So I'm going to be just talking about um, a sort of framework that I've thought of that's helped me frame a lot of the problems that I might have come up with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I don't have time to do the solutions, but I'm um, hopefully um, my kind of uh, way of thinking about the sort of dark matter problems that come up will be helpful to you guys. Um, so the first type of problem that, I've, that I see is an internet level problem, right? This is a problem or a situation that comes up where this is just how the internet works and maybe we have to all kind of think and realize that this hasn't been going on for that long. This is still in the early stages, I mean, relative to like geological and astrophysical time, right? Um, so um, a common one that comes up as an example is sort of the question of why does my custom font not look exactly the same on IE7 as it does on the brand new version of Google Chrome? Well, that's actually because browsers render in different, different ways and have different rules. And some, when someone asks me that question, I have to sort of walk back and say, look, this is an internet level issue, and let's talk about it. So, um, you know, just continuing to remember that um, not everything has been solved yet, and sometimes it's okay to say, "Look, we're all figuring this one out." So, let's let's find a creative way. Let's get some sort of you know workaround, or let let's talk about how we can frame it. Um, Next one is a system level problem. So a lot of times we're working with dynamic systems that are built on top of frameworks, whether we're talking about PHP, which this man's here to learn more about today or we remember, um, or we're working with Go or Node.js or anything like that. We have frameworks that have certain um, baseline um, assumptions that have been made. So sometimes we get a problem where someone says, you know, I'm expecting what I see on Facebook to be happening on Drupal, like live update, I'm expecting it, I just put my content in, and boom, why am I not seeing it? Well, there's some, some systems have caching, and you know, Facebook has a really, really huge development team. They've been developing their, roll their own PHP platform for like 10 years with you know, millions of dollars. So sometimes we have to sort of step back and realize this problem is part of the system, and that really helps to kind of frame like, you know, hey, we can solve this, it's possible, but maybe it's not gonna be, um, you know, something that's in the budget or in the timeline for what we're talking about. 
So kind of defining system level problems. Um, the next one is a business level problem. And this is actually one of my favorite ones because sometimes a dynamic system can actually help solve these business problems really easily. So sort of the idea of like the TPS report, it's the drudge of all the office folks. But we can automate that TPS report and we can put a workflow into an online system and we can actually help um, solve some of the problems that people may have spent a lot, a lot of time in their work days um, on before. So that's kind of the business level problem. And then the last one is sort of the, the person problem. Sometimes you get to a problem that's actually generated by a person or a group of people. And you sort of have to step back and look at the, uh, the humanity of it and sort of say, OK, you know, there's, there's a reason why we're putting a carousel on the home page. Our, our nonprofit, and we understand maybe it's not the best use of um, modern, you know, UX. Should I use a carousel or should I not? But it really helps us um, manage our stakeholders, and we're making this decision because it's going to help us with the people problem. And this is one solution. Um, and then, lastly, the general theme for kind of working through all of these, um, once you sort of have your, your problem framed, um, is communication to, to get to the solution. So, as far as communication strategies. Active listening is a huge one. Um, making sure that you're really like listening for the words in between what people are saying and what they might be kind of having behind or their motivations, and continuing to ask questions. Why? 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 Really, really helps get to the bottom of it. Focusing on solutions and making the conversation be more positive is definitely also a big part of that. Um, so that's kind of um, all I got. and. Um, Hopefully, you guys thought that was helpful. And I don't know where I'm at on time, because I didn't have my little timer. Um, am I good? Done? Yeah, you have two minutes. Oh, you have two minutes. Oh, OK. So if anyone has a question, um, I can answer them, I guess. Or I can just wrap up. Um, right. Frank? <laughs> I have worked with Frank before. <laughs> Tess, there we go. Uh, do you find that framing it this way helps the client digest it better? Definitely. Yeah. It, it, this this tactic, I sort of just organically came to this this like framework, and it really helps. Like, because a lot of my clients, you know, they're they they're not so familiar with tech, and they're they don't it, they're all really really like you know smart, engaged people, but it's not their focus. So when I kind of step back and say, oh, this one's an internet level. This is more about the system, and then there's. Hey, yeah, like we're getting it, we're getting it. So um, this has really, really helped me, and that's kind of why I wanted to share it with all of you guys. Um, it's helped me navigate the world of communicating in Drupal projects. Not specifically Drupal, but it's helped immensely um, when I've had to kind of ha have a lot of these conversations in big web projects. So, okay. Any other questions for Molly? Okay, let's hear it. Thanks, Molly. Bye. All right. Hold on, are we, are, are we set with, with Ben or are we doing Jacob next? Well, well, let's do Jacob next. There's no cable here. They move, oh, no, it's down here. Here it is. There you go. HDMI. Where'd the, who stole the, uh, the dongle? It's, it was stolen. All right, while that's happening, let me, let me give Jacob a, a proper introduction. Uh, Jacob Succi is a solutions architect manager for Acquia. He joined Acquia from his own Drupal consultancy where he worked with clients such as Brightcove, uh, the largest white label internet video hosting platform, uh, and Prima TV, the second largest commercial TV network in the Czech Republic. Uh, he has a master's in commuter, computer engineering from Czech Technical University in Prague. He is passionate about technology in Drupal. Show your passion. I, I, I don't know. This was handed to me. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, he showed his passion when he started the first Drupal Czech community and has continued to run it for the past five years. Jacob, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you can expense $300 worth of drinks today if you bring me two candidates, because everybody's hiring, and if Alex Ross matches that. So wait, Alex is going to give me the two candidates? 
Well, I, I don't care. I can't, I can't speak for the candidates, but I, I, can, I can match $300 for drinks. Woo. So between Acquia and NBC, drinks are on us. Up to $600. Whatever. <laughs> okay. So the first talk wasn't about Drupal. The second talk is not about Drupal either. I hope the third talk is about Drupal now. Yeah. I know Sam is going to come in and say, oh, you shouldn't be using Drupal. Um, so we'll see what happens. But what I want to talk about a little bit about is Drupal competition, because when we take a look at what we're doing here, there's obviously a lot of systems out there. And I promise I'm not going to mention WordPress even once, except now. But obviously, when you take a look at what we've been doing, we've done a great job at getting off the island, right? Drupal 8 is no longer the pile of code that we came up with. It's a symphony and everything else. And in my opinion, it's the same what we need to do with our understanding of the market. So what I want to do today is really give you an overview of one of the technologies that's out there that's competing with Drupal to show you what they're doing and to show you what we're competing with so you can gain a little bit more understanding. Because in the end, my goal is Drupal world dominance, right? Your goal as well? Yeah? Everybody, right? So to me, we need to understand what the competition is doing. So when you take a look at the market, there's hundreds of agencies like North Point and Phase 2 and all of these, or ZifTech, sorry, uh, Jody over here. Um, and a lot of them and hundreds of them, they've never heard of Drupal. They have no idea what it is. But they're, they're working with a system that you might heard of, or actually say Drupal if you've heard of Day Software. Have you heard of that? Yeah? Have you heard of CQ5 before? Yeah? Adobe Experience Manager? Yeah, there we go. So Adobe Experience Manager is a product from Adobe. It's actually an acquisition product. They bought it from Day Software. It was called CQ5. And now it's called Experience Manager. <coughs> Sounds awesome, right? And it's actually quite awesome. And uh, you know, to give you some perspective, the kind of educated guess is that this is a $500 million market for Adobe in terms of license fees for Adobe Experience Manager. It doesn't include implementation, any services around that. It's just licenses, right? So a huge market for them. And obviously, that means that they're kind of the gorilla, or they're the dragon in the room, right? And they're trying to eat us, and they're trying to eat everybody. And they're, they're actually quite good at it, but I can tell you that when they compete with us and we really get to the table, they often lose. Because obviously, we have a better product, right? Or I believe we have a better product. And typical deal, by the way, for Adobe Experience Manager is they'll go to the table and say, you know, the, the product is $100,000, and it's a small deal for them. They don't want to worry about that. Typically, it could be $500,000. It could be a million dollars just for the license of the product. And then they will come to the stage with partners. You know, they have a lot of partners as well. And they'll say, an implementation, by the way, you partners, you want services money, it's four times the license fee. So if you sell something for a million dollars, they expect the partner to come with a $4 million bill. right? So it's a huge product. And nobody was ever fired for buying Adobe. The reality is that that's, that's happening right now. So how do they sell this? right? They sell something that's called Adobe Marketing Cloud. Again, it sounds awesome. right? They, they, don't, they don't sell this to IT people. They don't sell this to most of us. They sell it to marketers. That's the new audience. You need to remember. This is our new audience, not IT people, but marketers. Those content editors, the people that create the experience, right? they're responsible for this. And they sell to them. And they show them how beautiful it is, how simple it is to use this. And they sell it in a concept of something that's called marketing cloud. right? It's everything you need to do digital marketing, everything you will ever need to do digital marketing. Adobe Experience Manager over here, that's just a simple part of that. But there's also a lot of other products. Right? And guess what? All of them are acquisition products. So uh, the Adobe Social, that's something that used to be called context optional or efficient frontier. The analytics, that's site catalyst, or uh, you've probably heard of that. The media optimizer is a product called Ensemble, and many more. So it's acquisition based. But at the same time, they say, this is the beautiful marketing cloud, and it's all integrated. 
Well, turns out I can't call it vaporware just in case some of them is in, you know, some of them are in the room. But the integration is kind of the north star that they're trying to achieve, but they're not there, and they will never be there fully because they can't really compete with the Drupal community, with all of you coming in and de de developing the Marketo module or developing the Google Analytics module. They can't compete with that, but they're trying. And what we need to do is be able to show everybody that the integrations that are in the Drupal community are better and can be, can be faster because you can do that. So have you seen this? This is the MacBook Air. This is the mother of all demos to me. You know, Steve Jobs with the envelope. Have you seen that before? The video, it's, it's just the best demo I've ever seen. So let me give you a quick demo of the product, OK? I can't give you a live demo for various reasons, including licensing reasons. But um, I can show you a video. I've had one of my colleagues create a video. So and it has no sound, so I'll just quickly comment on that. And it has like two minutes, but I have it on two speeds, two times the normal speed. So just watch this, and the goal is you're a marketer, right? You're responsible for content, and you need to edit this content, and you need to add a content call to action to a page. You have a page selling some products, and you want to add a button, right? So let me quickly play that. So you can see that you know I have a lot of sites here. You know I can get overview of all the sites, and I have a site called Geometrics, right? And I can take a look at the site. This is like a selling sports goods. So I'll take a look at the site. I'll open the site, and I'm immediately in something that's called edit mode. And I can go to a design mode. I can target content and all of that. But in here, I want to go back to the edit mode, right? And I want to start adding components. So maybe in here, I want to add the call to action. So I'll go to the components. So on the left side, I'm going to click on components. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say hey, add me three column component here. So I can start adding three columns, for example. And now I can start adding more. So I can, for example, say, hey, give me call to action and start filling it in. So, you know, call to action, click here, for example. So this is everything the marketer has to do to add a button to the site. Now, what do you need to do in Drupal? Add a block, place it in a context or a panel, depending on what you're using, right? Or something like that. So now I'm done, and that's all I have to do to basically add a call to action. So let me quickly go back to this. So I personally get these little butterflies in my stomach when I see this, right? It's so beautiful. If you're a marketer, it's so beautiful, and you've never seen anything that's better than that. Remember, the last 10 years, we've destroyed this market as developers. We've shown all the marketers those awful tools that just look awful, and they are so usable, but they look so awful. So the number one requirement for anybody that comes into a CMS selection is it has to be pretty, right? And by the way, you've seen this, right, Tom? You've seen this interface, right? Does it remind you of something? The interface when somebody drags and drop? Does it remind you of something in Drupal? Oops. It's in these panels. It's not very beautiful, right? Kind of, it's very usable, but it's not very beautiful, right? So we have tools like this. We have very usable tools like this in Drupal, but they're not beautiful. So the marketers, they're like, yeah, it's nice, but yeah, I, wish you, I wish you styled the form, you know? So it's kind of my message to you, right? As, as people or developers, we need to develop tools that are usable, but also beautiful, because that's the, that's the next step for us to achieve the world dominance for Drupal, right? And we've been working on something like this as Acquia. I, I don't know if you've seen the demo framework. It's, uh, it's our public distribution. You just go to the DF, projects, project slash DF on Drupal.org. It's kind of a demo. And it looks a little bit better. And we have interface like this where you know the panels interface, IPE. It's a little better. It just kind of looks a little bit better. And we're also working on something that's called Lightning. And I've talked about this like six months ago here. And that's, that's our way of thinking about this that you know, it's no longer enough to have 10 different interfaces and admin themes in Drupal, right? We can't just go into our customers with that. So we're trying to create a new kind of style of distribution called Lightning. It's going to be fully open source. It's actually on Drupal.org slash project slash Lightning right now. That's going to be the, the base for everything that 
we hope to do in Drupal in terms of editorial interface, admin interface, and everything else. It's not going to provide functionality because uh, a lot of the uh, distributions out there have failed because they tried to provide too much functionality, right? So it's not going to provide functionality, but it's going to be the admin interface. And I would encourage you to you know, take a look and maybe apply for a job because we're hiring full-time developers for this. So if you want to work on open source, this is a good way to do that. And in the end, you can join a team like this. So this is my team. Um, and you can just email me. And you know, I'm, I'm paying for the drinks, so just email me someone. <laughs> All right. Do you, do you have to wear glasses to be on your team? Yeah, those are Acura glasses. Yeah. Every, OK, everyone has to wear glasses? Yeah. Uh, any quick questions for Jacob? Questions? OK, no thank you very much. There was oh, one question. There was one. Um, you mentioned the integration piece was a little bit weak for the competitor, um, Adobe Experience Manager, I guess. Um, it, does that ever come up in conversations with like when they're selling it, or how, how have they found ways to sort of work around that in getting market share? Sure. So my team tries to make it come up, you know, because my team were the people that make users use Drupal, right? So we try to make it up um, or make it come up. Adobe will come in and say, yeah, you can do whatever you want, right? And it's true, you can do whatever you want. But with Drupal, it's going to be faster, cheaper, and better, right? So that's the message. All right. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! All right, we're going to bring back up to the stage now that we've got everything all worked out. We're going to bring Ben Malison, Malinson back up. Uh, he's still the lead author of the Definitive Guide of Drupal. Um, I'm not going to go through the rest again, but here is Ben, and his presentation is not here. So I'll go through the rest of this again. He's still the co-founder of Agaric now. Yes, no? Hmm. It's no longer a Linux problem. No, it's on a Mac now. Good? Is this it? I hope this is it. Rockefeller Center was built in 1942. At the time it was built, it was the seventh tallest building in the country. I'm making this up as I go. Just saying. Huh? I just pulled it out of my head. Yeah, all right. <laughs> and no signal. Yes, we have a winner. Ben, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Basic point of talk. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Basic point of talk is that um, there's uh, Drupal is fantastic for what it does, um, but has not evolved too all that quickly in the past decade. And we've gotten a taste of it from some of the presentations. And keep in mind everything Jacob just said um, about our competitors when we're talking about this one. Uh, you can follow along. Um, it, the links will be in the etherpad.mozilla.org slash future dash here. Um, makes it much easier to click than to try to guess what I'm showing in slides. All right, so this is the feature we were promised expecting to arrive. And this is where we end up, driven into a ditch. This is a car that um, they, they hooked up the, um, the media console to the internet and also to power brakes and steering and stuff like that. Um, so this is the future. Um, 1.6 million Jeeps were, um, were recalled for, for this small design flaw of having basically you know, hackable over the internet um, steering. So Cory Doctorow has been on this uh, point a long time. Computers and the internet are everywhere, and the world is increasingly made of them. Um, you know, the principles of free software, having control of the things that control our lives, are ever more important. You know, ever more things are, you know, powered by computers, and those things are ever more important to how we live or don't live. Uh, this is a plane with a software bug. Um, People died as earlier this year, um, and so we 
you know, that we have to admit that computers have also made us safer and will probably continue to make us safer. It's uh, my favorite. Um, right now, <laughs> 30, 40,000 people a year die on the highway uh, driving, and driverless cars will probably save a lot. But the, the question is, who is going to control this? Or are we, how are we going to make sure that, um, that you know, the, you know, we, the people who are in, in danger um, and whose lives are, are being controlled, by computers driving us around are actually in charge. And if you think that, okay, I mean, we're just going to figure it out. We're just going to, you know, we're not going to make such a huge mistake with something that's controlling so much of our lives. This is the, uh, we're coming up on the 30th anniversary of the first computer virus. A um, couple of uh, people in Pakistan uh, saw like how bad security was with MS-DOS coming out and they wrote a virus um, that infected like most of the MS-DOS computers in the world at that time. And Microsoft went on to become the standard with abysmal security the entire time. So um, we can't count on uh, something not becoming a standard just because it's bad. Which brings us to my one and only qualification for giving this talk. This was on a website that's still up that I just saw the other day. Um, my one qualification for giving this talk is in 15 years of web development, I have not once used Flash. The point is the future is here. Um, and if you're in Cambridge like I am a lot, you actually see these all of the time. It's scary. Uh, <laughs> this is not in Cambridge. This is, of course, um, China. But um, the, the future is already here. These are solar panels in, um, in Bhutan. I think, um, and this is uh, a prison in uh, West Virginia. The future is not evenly distributed. We're still doing things extremely backwards and badly for ourselves. So um, the real back to the future here is static websites. Um, we, a lot of us since started out in Drupal, making Drupal sites um, particularly for the exact reason that they were not static that we could give control to clients, to the owners of the websites, that they could log in and change what's on the text without having to call a designer and say, hey, I need to change a word on my website and spend five weeks trying to track down the person who originally made their website. Um, Drupal was a huge advance over static sites. Um, but as we saw with Drupal again, there's a lot of risk of just having a database hooked up to the internet. And that risk isn't just for the site and the sites that get a talk attacked by the botnet that takes over, the risk is also um, to our environment. The internet is um, to blame for 2% of global warming emissions. And that's the same as air travel, um, which is immense. And a lot of that is um, you know, these really high-powered, fancy sites. Um, but a lot of it is just sites that every time someone visits, it's spinning up a database, it's doing all of that. It's just using more resources than it needs to. So the wild idea I'm uh, pitching is that um, Drupal can start to compete with things like Squarespace and ultimately even the grid, which bills itself as um, the future of web development, artificial intelligence making websites. It's very interesting that they position themselves very much about owning your own content, even though they're a proprietary platform. Their point is, we're going to get you to make your own website don't build it on Facebook. So it is, they are sort of part of the fight for the open web. Um, but um, so the exciting thing for me is that because we are off the island, because Drupal is being, u being made with um, Symfony and the whole PHP community, all of these, all of the things for like artificial intelligence, if it really works for web development, that's actually going to become commodity sooner than later, um, as long as we're sharing it with everybody on Packagist, and all of the projects that are built using Symfony, all of them. There are many. Um, but the, 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 just the, the fact that we have um, Packagist for, for sharing things, that finally Drupal, that finally PHP has uh, a good place for package management, um, you know, that's more easily used and looks like it's going to catch on much better. Um, than uh, some previous ones that will go unnamed managed to do, um, gives a, a really good chance for us to, to develop um, the, um, all of these tools. And this goes a lot to, I think, Drupal's advantage over things like um, um, the 
Adobe uh, Experience Manager. And uh, there's another Cory Doctorow quote. Um, and the point is that um, when people are able to choose their own tools, that's how the computers first went into businesses in the first place. People would, they couldn't do what they needed to do on the mainframe, even though it's a much less powerful personal computer, they started innovating on that. And it's the same we're seeing people moving to cloud services to do all kinds of things that normally would be handled internally by the company. And when you bring that to um, getting out of these monolithic frameworks and letting people just uh, experience, experiment with what they can do, nothing's going to beat free software for that. And that gives me a lot of hope for Drupal's future. Um, so just uh, to close the loop on the, the static websites, the sort of the, the, the idea there is that we could create um, uh, a, a front end manager, sort of like if you ever um, seen a website that said it was you know run by code from GitHub, and if you saw a typo on the website, you can just go click edit, write in the interface on GitHub, edit the typo, and hit submit. That is an incredibly fantastic um, uh, content authoring experience and uh, collaboration experience. And if you were to build a front end like that, in, like GitHub, but in Drupal actually meant for content and not for code, and had Drupal be the deployment platform for tons of static websites, I think you could replace a lot of the sites that are being built with WordPress, but to a greater extent, um, you know, GoDaddy and every other web um, place selling domain names is offering static sites, which are terrible and they charge like by the page and all of that stuff. These are things that, um, you know, uh, free, the free software should be destroying and it's, I think Drupal as a static site generator could do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but the key to uh, bring the innovation of Drupal is um, new types, is, is uh, installation profiles and new types of distributions. I'm excited to see Aqua in that game. Uh, I just, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, distributions. And I think the most exciting thing is when we get to ones like Open Lucius, where they also have it as a service. So you can download it yourself, or you can use free software hosted by someone else. And so you have all the convenience of um, software as a service, but all the potential power of your own um, software. And those are the business models that I think we as a community need to be looking towards. And that's when we can have the resources to put into polishing it to make the experience really awesome. And then to get rid of the uh, room finds another cool one, Farmier. Um, so in conclusion, future is here. It's not even distributed. A lot of the bad stuff is uh, here in the future. And that can be taken as a, as a metaphor for the, um, the, the stealing of the commons. This is Central Park and uh, I'm sorry, this is Prospect Park. And the buildings cropping up around it are stealing the value that was created by the park and intruding on the park's solitude. Um, and that's sort of what Facebook is doing with people watching it, looking at it 14 times a day. Um, they're, these are all companies whose valuations are largely based on grabbing our data. And, the, and right after my talk, I did this before, I Palantir with a spy group in that list raised even more money. Um, but these, com these companies that are based on our data, Waze, which was bought by Google for a billion something, um, says very explicitly on their homepage still right now that their value comes from real people working together and our value that we're contributing to Facebook, to Uber, to all of these things, these things that we look ahead to the future options, the future possibilities, we can create a, create the platforms that get the value for ourselves. And so um, I do encourage you to um, follow the links in the in the pad, or just go to Dries Boithard's blog, uh, which has some of the best writing on how to win back the open web out there. And I, you know, I was just looking for this period and finding the best stuff right here by the benevolent dictator for life in, in Drupal. And uh, that's really exciting. Um, but in short, walled gardens are winning because they have a superior user experience. And as value shifts from software um, to the ability to leverage data, companies will have to rethink their businesses and uh, free software and our connected communities that are thinking about this have a real chance to 
come at, back in and win. Um, and one of the technologies for sort of recreating these these platforms in a way that is all of us can um, participate in. So instead of giving all of your data and power to one um, company like Facebook, whatever one wins that vertical, us building a platform like the open internet itself, like Drupal itself, we all build on one platform, but we can create sites that add value and then contribute value back to the middle, to the software. We can build the same things and contribute the value back into common data stores, um, data distributed throughout the internet, and the indie web community is a, a really one I encourage you to check out and look at. That's that. Um, Oh yeah, just in closing. Um, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> um, you know, Facebook is not the most evil company out there and that Google doesn't even come close. I mean, like, there's a lot of competition out there. And so just to pick an easy example, the whole oil industry, they're built on extracting value from a common resource and keeping it for themselves, selling it back to everybody at extortionate rates, and destroying the planet at the same time. So nothing that we can do in the internet can come close, but the exciting thing is this horrible, horrible business model, which you know they have governments fighting wars for them and everything, is, is losing to distributed, much more open um, solar. And so if um, that can be done in the real world, um, um, solar and wind energy, winning over this, this sort of centralized, gigantic um, power plants and dams and stuff like that, then surely we can win an open, decentralized web. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much. Real quick, quick questions. All right, let us move on, thank you. We are going to go to Frank Carey. Is Frank ready with slides and being, thank you, and mic'd and all that good stuff. I'd like to make a correction. Um, Rockefeller Center was actually built in 1933. I looked it up, and at the time, it was the fifth tallest building in New York City, so. So close. I was. I really, yeah. Um, okay, so Frank is going to come on up. Frank has worked professionally on Drupal for almost 10 years. Uh, at companies from small dev shops, startups, and Sony Music. He's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of the development process. He founded DaVinci in 2015, which he'll be talking about and demonstrating, I assume, um, in 2015 to dramatically improve the process through to that process. Hmm. Yeah, I, I lost something. Who got the Frank Carey. I have the clicker up here. All right, automating your dev workflow with the new DaVinci module. Yay. Here we go. You need to like mic to walk, so I might move this a little bit. All right. Can you guys hear me? And, uh, test, test, test. Just give me a mic. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Is there a way to turn it up a little bit? No. That's pretty good, actually. I can hear. It's not the 70s. I'll do this, and uh, maybe I'll be a little. Is that a little bit better? All right, cool. Uh, so yeah. So let's see if this is working. Sweet. All right. So I'm Frank Carey. Uh, I've been doing Drupal for almost 10 years. It uh, it lies on my page a little bit. I was late to uh, set up a Drupal.org account. Um, so I've been working in Drupal for a long time, and um, Basically, seen a lot of things, seen a lot of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of how development gets done with Drupal and also other platforms, right? I've definitely gotten off the island the last few years and tried out other things. And uh, one thing I think would recommend to do is if you haven't read, like how many people know the first book, right? If you've ever been in any kind of startup or near a startup, you probably have seen this. Uh, but I don't think as many people have read this book. And I would highly recommend this book. Uh, it's in novel form, it's like DevOps business manual in a novel form. It sounds crazy, but uh, it's an amazing book that what I think does really well is highlights the fact that at this point with how much software has eaten the world already, and it's only going to get worse or better depending on what your job title is, um, <laughs> that it's business critical at this point, right? I mean, it's been business critical for a long time, but 
when sites don't launch or you know how many people I won't say how many people are on Ashley Madison but how many people have heard of Ashley Madison sometimes <laughs> right so when things go wrong with software things can go you know seriously wrong with your business uh, the one of the authors of the book Gene Kim this is his slide he sells he says this is the slide that sells DevOps right and so what it tries to focus on is what operations sees is you know these two silos what each team sees and what the you know the final result is that your company's market share goes down and your business misses commitments and the, to make up for it the business makes even larger commitments that then don't even get you know the developers don't even get asked before they commit to some deadline about some big new project right but then it comes and falls in their lap they ship things late they throw they throw you know they get it there the day before it's barely working they drop it over the fence to operations operation takes it and d tries to do what they can and it's just sort of a, a vicious cycle so my my opinion like i i got into development uh i wasn't a computer science person right i got into computer development because I needed to do something. I had a goal that I was trying to accomplish, and I'm a person who likes to, you know, collaborate and uh, you know solve problems and be experimental. So, like, this is what development to me should be like, right? And I think we've all started, like, whether you've maybe even just started, you know, you start in like even like say Node.js or something. You, like your first week, you're like, man, it's just like this, right? And then then you build something in Node.js or Drupal, right? And it ends up being more like this, right? <laughs> and so. What happened, right? It was, it was we were going, we were on two wheels. It was great. Everything was going well. How do we get to this point, right? I think we got to this point because there's just not time, right? We run out of time. There's just not time to do things right, right? We 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 do experiment. We get things, but there's a great slide that was going around Twitter the other day. It was like, you know, the project expectations and then progress and then like just ship it. Just the the expectations dropped by a good chunk and just get the thing out the door, right? And then you're like, oh, well, we'll just fix that later. But that never really comes, comes around. So the things that we should be going back and doing and spending more time on are like paying down that technical debt, uh, trying out new things, right? Whether it's D8, like, you know, most of us can't even find the bandwidth to try out D8 because we're still patching up some D5 site or something that's still trying to run. Uh, you know, tooling and training, right? I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of teams. I think it, it amazes me. I mean, you can come to a meetup, but it amazes me that like training is not like a de facto thing that uh, development teams are doing on a constant basis, right? Uh, so w what we're trying to focus on with DevOps, I think, is really so these three pieces, right? Uh, trying to set up a test CI, C, you know, how many people know CI, right? Continuous integration, CD, continuous deployment, right? Which basically just means like. If it's ready, get, get it out the door. Like, don't wait to some giant monolithic release, uh, like Windows 10 or something. And you know, automation and maintenance, right? Uh, and tooling. So like, we're going to talk about that too. So what are we? So uh, DaVinci is a DevOps platform. Uh, we're trying to make the process more like the, the fun slide and less like the firefighter slide. And uh, we're hiring. So you know, reach out to us at DaVinci IO Careers. Uh, we have an office in the Hudson Valley, and we're hiring remote people. Who knows who this person is? See some hands. Well, I didn't say who can read the slides. I said who knows who this person is, right? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, right? Uh, Grace Hopper is my hero. Um, why is she my hero? Is it because she's the first or one of the early, you know, female programmers? Uh, no, I think she was a programmer who, a great programmer who happened to be a woman. Uh, she was the first lazy programmer, right? So. Grace's claim to fame amongst, you know, having a, uh, she worked in the Navy, uh, wa actually uh, was here at Vassar uh, upstate as a professor uh, until 1941 when Pearl Har Harbor happened. She joined the, the Navy and went on to like illustrious career as, you know, a, a pioneer in computer science. What she tried to put out there was, you know, the men or whoever were working at the time were, were basically coding things with assembly. And she said that this is, in the 50s, she said this is foolish. Like why, only a few people can do this, it's very selective, and it's a pain in the ass. Why can't we write things more like an English way and then just, I don't know, compile things down? But there were no compilers. So she wrote the first compiler, right? Uh, she wrote, or and was key, at least key as part of other teams, she wrote COBOL, right? Which is the first big programming, or the first programming language besides like assembly. Um, so like to me, like she's my hero and, and someone that I take uh, 
you know, trying to say, let, let's save time. Let's think outside the box and find new ways of doing things. So, uh, so DaVinci is a module as well. And uh, I want to say, like, we should all be using these tools that we've built, uh, you know, not just because we built them and you should use them, but because, you know, we have to save time, right? We all have to, we don't have time during the day to mess around doing things over and over again. So whether it's this tool or some fork of it or some other way you can think about doing, we have to find ways to save time. So with the Vinci module, the idea is to like standardize the platforms across the different environments, uh, or excuse me, standardize the environments across different platforms. So Acquia has basically this, this is an Acquia screenshot. Pantheon has something almost exactly the same, right? They may, I think they call this test. Uh, but any other situation you have, whether you're deploying to Rackspace or your own custom thing, uh, you're gonna have some sort of interface like this. And the idea is let's try to standardize that and make it easy. So it does, uh, it sets up these four standard environments. You can add more if you like, but it sets up a local development test and production environment. Uh, if you enable the environment indicator module, you'll get these for each environment you're in. Uh, how many people have done something by accident in production because they thought they were on some other version of the site? I have. Uh, and it also, even with the tabs, right? I'm a person who has about three billion tabs open at any one time. And uh, it gives you these little indicators on the tab itself, right? So the idea being that you can just simply copy a database. You know, if you, what you're normally doing is pulling a production database back to one of these various environments. You do that step, whether it's a drag and drop operation or it's a Drush SQL sync or whatever you're doing, and it just magic the next page load. It swaps the environments and does magic things for you. Uh, so the things it can do is enable and disable modules, right? Not rocket science, but we'll go into what is rocket science about that. Customizing settings and clearing all the caches. So how many people have tried Features Master yet? OK, you should all go right now and try that out. So the idea of Features Master is uh, one of the things that we export through features, like all the things, but one thing that hasn't been traditionally exported is what modules are named. Isn't that like the most important critical you know, step or critical configuration thing that you have, like what modules are enabled on your site? So all it does is just export. These are all the enabled modules out. And it's uh, we'll go through a study now. Um, and then the, a new feature is basically you could set within your different environments, you say, uh, these are the temporary enabled modules. So whenever it's in that environment, it looks at this uh, variable, and it will automatically add these to your list. Or in this case, it will turn off modules on the list. And so normally, you could just do this with Drush, or with, excuse me, with modules enable. Uh, but the beauty of, go back, the beauty of uh, Features Master is that when you're using this and then you go to re-export your modules, it's smart enough to ignore anything you temporarily added. So it's not gonna, when you re-export, it's not gonna add any of these to the list. The same thing with something that's temporary disabled. Even though you don't have syslog enabled locally, when you re-update your features that are exported, uh, it'll add the syslog module. So uh, changing configuration I think is really important. Uh, you should have all your, uh, you should have all your errors showing to you locally. You should not have errors showing on production. Uh, you want to clear your cache. You want to make sure you're not emailing your customers by testing out some. I've done that. I've emailed thousands of customers by accident doing an import. Uh, all right, just sold. So how do we do it? I've got to run through. Um, you've got to install the module. DaVinci is the only one that's required. All of these are optional but recommended. You create a feature. So let's use a custom module. You say. Uh, this is my, you, where is it? There. Uh, you just select enable modules. So you don't have to select the individual modules. You copy uh, example settings.php in. It's got, here's like the switches. So you can say, you flush all the caches. When I go to the development environment, also revert specific features. And in your local environment, you set up and just declare that as your local environment. And that's it, right? With all the extra time you save, I hope you reach out to us at DaVinci. Uh, HQ on Twitter, uh, and you can sign up for a private beta. And I love this quote by Bruce Lee, who says, "You know, don't waste time because that's what life's made out of." So, cheers. All right, thank you very much, Frank. Are there any Are there any questions for Frank about DaVinci or DevOps or what he actually emailed to thousands of customers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quick question. Uh, is it, is it, how useful is it without features, if you, if you do a non-features development workflow? 
uh, it doesn't require features, so you could take advantage of the the sort of setup it, it, it allows you to have, but you wouldn't get the automatic, you know, you'd have to s enable disable modules or whatever things you want to do. You just have to do that separately. Great question. Anybody else? Anyone else? Sam Richard. I'll repeat the question. What What did you email to all of those people? Uh, it was a travel site, and it was all like, hey, that 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 article that you were interested in has been updated, and I sent thousands of them out by fax. Because the client wanted me to change one thing. Well, I want to see that. Can you just turn off the security bit? Like, sure, sure. Of course, forgot to turn it back on. All right. One more question. Uh, last question. I heard. <laughs> if um, the different staging environments, the development and, and stuff, um, do people need to have user access to be able to view those, or could they be public subdomain type type situations? Um, I think what you're asking is the indicator stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a separate contrib module, and you can enable the permissions for that as you like. Whether you want, you know, you want it to even if you're signed out to be able to see the indicator. I usually just leave it where you're signed in because you're not going to be able to do anything scary until you're logged in. Anyway. Okay. And also works for like when you're doing CI and stuff like that, when you're doing your tests, uh, like on uh, Circle CI or Travis or something like that, you can use this as well to set that environment so that you know the right things are turned on and off as you're doing your testing. All right, we're going to have to call it for time, even though Monty has a question. Monty's going to find Frank after the talks. OK. Um, thank you very much, Frank. We're going to. Um, we're going to bring up Jody Hamilton, and she's going to talk about lessons learned in Jody's world 10 years and 10 minutes. Uh, Jody is the CTO and co founder of ZivTech, a Philadelphia based open source consultancy. Uh, an expert Drupal generalist, she is passionate about empowering her team and ensuring top quality of everything they work on. Thank you. All right, Jody. So I, I didn't want to get, you know, I only have 10 minutes. I didn't want to get all into something technical. So it's going to be kind of like random, random tidbits. Um, so yeah, I'm the CTO and co-founder of ZipTech in the greatest city ever, Philadelphia. How many of you own a home? Oh, none, because you don't live in Philadelphia. <laughs> Probably can't afford it. Um, so I've been a, a Drupal developer since 4.7. And... Um, before that, I was a chemist. I had a career as a chemist, and I was a math teacher. And what I really care about is actually not Drupal and not even the internet, but I'm a, I'm a team leader and uh, a job creator. And what I really care about is my team. And so I have a great team at ZivTech, and I'm really most concerned about you know people first and um, technology second. There you go. Oh, is it? So, related to people first, code, especially open source code, doesn't really have very much value. And so I've noticed a lot of people will fixate on, oh, can we reuse this code? Can we, um, can we take this code that we did before and, and use it again? Oh, maybe you shouldn't share that code with the community. But that's like being like a, a dairy farmer and worrying about an old gallon of milk, whether it's still good or not, right? The actual code is just something that is just a, a byproduct of what the coders create. If you have great coders, they're always going to make better code. So the code, especially open source code, don't, don't fixate so much on the code. It's really about people. And people are powered with emotion and um, you know human things. It's not, the code is just sort of comes out pretty easy. Writing code is pretty easy when you have good coders. Um, I want to talk a little bit about hiring and, and the actual, the people, the coders, and the other, not, not just coders, but lots of the people who, who work on websites and some of the lessons that I've learned about the people. One is that great scientists are bad engineers. And so, it, strangely, in our field, there's this major called computer science. But nobody hires computer scientists. I mean, they, they go and work at, at schools, maybe, or they go do some research. There's, you know, there's some jobs. But really, we're software engineers. And most places don't even have a major in software engineering. It's all just computer science. The difference, one of the differences between scientists and engineers, I don't mean just in terms of like 
what your major was, but just in the way you think, scientists are always looking for, um, they're curious. They're looking for puzzles. They're, they're, they're always finding something new to investigate. But engineers, it's not that they're not curious. It's just that they're more focused on getting something accomplished. And so they're not going to just continually find more things to explore without any sense of how much time they're spending or what their real goal is. So actually, in my career as a scientist, I found that engineers, people who thought like engineers were actually better scientists than a lot of the scientists because the real, real scientists were always finding something new to study that had nothing to do with what we were trying to accomplish. So if you're, if you're having a group of developers, it's okay to have a couple scientists, maybe, but mostly you want engineers. Another thing that, um, this is like a really common, I don't even know who originally made this, if anyone knows, it's super old. It's, it's like a, you know, a picture of the learning curve of Drupal. And I added on to it one of the things that I noticed, which is that, I just added on that little guy at the top, which is that one of the problems that, that, that we have in the Drupal sphere which you, you could kind of notice just from like the group of people who's up here talking. I heard a lot of people in the audience, they said they want to learn more about Drupal. What is Drupal? I want to learn more about Drupal. We're not talking about Drupal, are we? No, we're sick of it because <laughs> we, already, we already made it all the way up there. And by the time we made it up there, we all along the way learned everything about PHP and MySQL and Apache and Nginx and Varnish and Memcache and Redis and Ubuntu and Git and a million other things. And by the time we got up there, we said, well, why are we using a beginner's tool that makes websites easy to make for people who don't know any of these things? Because we had to learn to become experts in all of them in order to fix the bugs in this damn thing, right? So by the time you get up there, you're like, well, what do I really need like a dynamic query generator for when I can write queries with my eyes closed, right? So, there's, so these people are not good hires, <laughs> most of them. <laughs> <laughs> These people, once they get up there, they're sick of it. And um, so, so I would, my, what I've found over the years, I, at first I thought, let's hire these core contributors. Let's hire these people that have been doing it for 10 years. They're going to be amazing at it. But what you really find is that some people who've been doing it a long time aren't really that interested in you know, doing the same tough, dirty work that is sort of the bread and butter of... Uh, of Drupal development. But on the other hand, even worse problem is baby bird syndrome. So a baby bird is what a friend of mine, Nick, calls a developer who you have to chew their food for them first and then give it to them in their, in their mouth. A lot of developers are like this. So, so they can write code, right? Guess what? Writing code is really easy. That's why everyone's like, oh, we're going to go learn how to write code. My skill is writing code. And people learn this and just like, they go to like a boot camp and they learn to write code in like a few weeks. It's not that hard. It's not that rare of a skill. But these people that they can write code and that's sort of their thing and that's it. Well, real life comes at them and it's, and it's just a client saying a bunch of babble. You don't even know what they're talking about. And they go, well, I don't know what to, to do with that. I just write code. So you have to say, oh, OK, well, I'll go back to the client. I'll ask them all about it. I'll, I'll verify what they're talking about. I'll figure out where it is you need to be working and what other things are going on that you need to know about in order to write the actual code to change this. And by the time you give it to them, you've already chewed up the whole problem, solved the whole problem, spit in their mouth. Now all they have to do is type out the stupid little letters. It's not, that's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out what the problems are and what people are saying like beneath their problems and what really matters to them and, and all of that. So a lot of times it's those people with the good soft skills that you can teach them to code but you can't always teach people how to, how to think for themselves. Um, so a lot of these baby bird type of programmers, they also have this, um, they, don't, they don't test their code. Some even more experienced people, they just write code and they're like, well, I, you know, I only do the, I write the code. I'm not QA, I just write the code, now I'm done. Well, what I believe is if you didn't test it, it doesn't work. 
Now, I'm not saying that if you couldn't get lucky once in a while, maybe you would get lucky. But I'm just saying the fact that you didn't test it already means that you failed. Just because you got lucky doesn't mean that you didn't do something wrong. Okay, so testing, the more you work for bigger high stakes projects, the more it's really just all about testing and QA and the actual writing of the code is trivial. Okay, another um, lesson that I've learned over the years, I've spent a lot of my career fighting other people's technical debt. I don't think you can ever overestimate how much it costs you and I don't think it's ever okay to just go into technical debt and then leave me to clean up your mess. Um, I also think we need to focus on usability completely. Every single thing that we do as software developers, even if you're not doing a content management system, everything is for use by people. Usability is not a side project. It's the entire purpose of everything that we're doing. Um, I'll skip that one. <laughs> quality is not an add-on. Similar, you have to focus on quality the entire time. I was a quality chemist, and so when I first came to software development, I was like, I can't believe how uninterested in quality people are. Um, and the more I've been in the field, the more I've been convinced that I'm right, that it's the most important thing. And don't drink any Kool-Aid. I don't care if they say that that's, uh, I was born on the day of the Jim Jones massacre when they drank the flavor eight. I don't, when people say, come to Drupal and drink the Kool-Aid, I don't even know if they still say that. But, and then they tell you, don't hack core and only use popular modules. They're completely wrong. Do not listen to these people. You know what happens when you drink Kool-Aid. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jody. I, I decided I'm going to hold the mic like this because it just looks funny. Um, we're going we're gonna to hold off on questions because we're running low on time. Um, our, our next presenter is hopefully all mic'd up and presentation ready back there. I think he is. Uh, so Neil Drum is going to be talking about Drupal CI. Um, and Neil is uh, the lead architect on Drupal.org right now for the Drupal Association, which has been doing a lot of awesome work on Drupal.org. You should all be very, very thankful to Neil and his team. Um, and he's also a member of the security team, was a maintainer of Drupal 5 core, so that's pretty awesome. And um, he's going to talk to us about continuous integration and Drupal CI and all that good, fun stuff. Here we go. Thank you, Neil. So yeah, I'm Neil Drum. I work for the uh, Drupal Association. I do a lot of work on all parts of Drupal.org. Uh, and uh, recently, one of my main projects has been uh, working on uh, Drupal CI specifically. I'm on the Drupal.org integration side. Uh, and that's uh, a module uh, called Project Issue File Test. Uh, so if you've ever developed uh, uh, for projects on Drupal, uh, on Drupal.org, like um, especially Drupal Core, uh, you've probably seen someone ask you for needing tests and um, this. Uh, so we're replacing all of that uh, because it was built in 2008, uh, and we can do things a little bit better now. And it's it's one of these projects that accumulated. A, know what? It was maintained, but only on life support uh, for the past four to six years. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's been time to replace it. And we're doing more standard things like uh, Jenkins instead of Drupal to kick off everything. Uh, if you want to automate things, use Jenkins, or even just running cron on your site. Uh, yeah. uh, decent sized website. Uh, use it uh, in you know, Amazon Web Server uh, Services instead of uh, uh, we used to have some donated boxes through here with Oregon, uh, and what else? Uh, Docker. Uh, those are all things that didn't exist in 2008. Or I think AWS is maybe around for two years before then, but wasn't usable in the same way. Uh, so another big thing is uh, that whole system. You couldn't really set it up uh, yourself. 
people patch this up on drupal.org just to test them. Well, you can uh, test things locally uh, with this since it was you know, built from the ground up to be uh, work with Docker and you get the same environment locally as we're running on uh, our like uh, big AWS boxes. Uh, so you can actually uh, clone the project and uh, uh, unless you're on Linux, you'll probably use Vag uh, Vagrant uh, that sets up environment and um, more importantly everything's the same it's all uh, standardized and you're not going to have something break because uh, your computer is different because your computer is different uh, and uh, we built a uh, symphony console uh, command line utility to wrap all of this uh, so you don't have to you'll end up learning some docker if you run this uh, but a lot of this is abstracted away that uh, we have this command line utility that uh, running uh, these commands will set up everything. Uh, and there's a much better uh, description of it on, on uh, drupal.org linked at the bottom there. Uh, and uh, I try it on my laptop. It takes four hours to run the whole test group, uh, or all of the tests for Drupal 8 core. Uh, there's a lot of tests, it's pretty good coverage. Uh, you don't want to run them all on your laptop. Uh, you know, the AWS boxes we get are running in like 20, 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, we try to abstract away a lot of the setup uh, into this uh, Symphony console uh, Drupal CI command. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's lots of options. And one of the other big improvements is uh, since everything's pluggable, uh, we're testing Postgres uh, and SQLite and you know, all these things that you know, Drupal's kind of supported uh, for the past few, few versions. Uh, you know, Drupal 8's gonna come out and have you know, well-tested Postgres and SQLite support. And uh, you know, if you have other databases, you can try getting us out with that. Uh, you'll have to you know, build your own containers and everything like that. Uh, so the part that I, I really know most about is the uh, uh, Drupal.org integration. So if you've been uh, on the issue for uh, mostly Drupal 8 core, but some contrib modules, uh, probably seen that the next to the files, you get more results now. Uh, so yeah, you can test things through Drupal.org on all of that, uh, uh, on all of the environments. Uh, and uh, we're kind of getting rid of the old QA.drupal.org and putting everything straight onto one website. So it's just easier to integrate uh, the two. We don't have uh, the two sites for before talking over XML RPC, which you don't really set up new things with that nowadays. And Doing a database call is easy and can pull up all the res results. And uh, uh, some of the future work will be easier. Uh, so, right now, uh, there's still some requirements on uh, you know, Postgres isn't completely working. Uh, and some of that's uh, problems with uh, Drupal 8 uh, core, some of that's some IP stuff on our test runner. We're fig figuring that out and turning off the legacy test bots. So uh, the uh, this is kind of a agglomeration of both things. The uh, the top half is the old, uh, old results and bottom half is the new results. And we're keeping both around for now to see uh, that they're the same, uh, or at least Drupal CI is doing better. Uh, and yeah, we'll turn off the old test bots. They're expensive. Uh, we'll save a few thousand a month that way. Uh, so email notifications and canceling your test. Uh, instead of a few uh, admins being able to do that on QA. everyone will be able to do that. Uh, and uh, some other uh, contrib test discovery, that's kind of a technical, I don't understand that issue, but we're, we're making it work. Uh, uh, and yeah, better error reporting, 
Uh, right now, it's kind of an ugly error if uh, your patch doesn't apply. And, and we'll switch over to, uh, right now, if, if your tests fail on Drupal CI, uh, it won't do anything, but uh, we will give it the power to set your issues to needs work. Uh, and then we'll do um, uh, Drupal 7 and 6 testing. Uh, those had, have uh, good test coverage, especially Drupal 7. Uh, and we're looking to finish off the replacement in the next few weeks. Maybe not totally before Barcelona, but certainly for Drupal 8. Uh, pretty good, amb ambitious schedule. Uh, that's it. Any questions? Or do we have time for questions? I think we have time for one question. All right. Uh, is there anybody thinking about a move to Behat or wrapping simple tests with Behat? Uh, so part of the architecture of this is uh, uh, everything is more abstracted and uh, yeah, next to the simple test we have a PHP unit and the possibility for more things. Uh, we use Behat for our own internal testing of Drupal.org. I certainly like it and yeah, there's, you know, it'll be up to the core maintainers decide how they want to drive Drupal core. And uh, yeah, I hope someone writes some containers to get the app running, because that's, that's the whole process. Uh, yeah, our Behat system is actually not working right at the moment, because we have our own. And yeah, Sunny Epsilonium is something that needs to be standardized. All right, thanks a lot, Neil. Neil Drum, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, next up, I believe, is Sam. Is that right? Yes. I'm going to go with yes. Um, Sam Richard is going to be talking about um, things that are not Drupal. Um, his talk is called I Promise It's Safe Outside. Uh, Sam is a UX architect at IBM on the Watson team. Uh, he's also known as Snug Ugg on all the internets. Uh, he's a developer with design tendencies and a love for building open source tools to help with both. If you've been following his Twitter, he just made a linter for SAS. Um, he's the author of North, of North uh, chair of SASConf, and an accomplished bacon connoisseur, which is actually true. That's not just like, you know. It's not hyperbole. That's not hyperbole. So here we go. Sam Richard, ladies and gentlemen. Hey everyone, how are you? Good, yeah. So like I said, I'm gonna try and convince you to not use Drupal tonight. So, how many people for most of their technical career have primarily used Drupal? Hands of you. How many people primarily use the LAMP stack, so PHP? Yeah, pretty much. How many people have primarily just done back-end development and not really touch front-end development? How about front-end developers? How many people know what blue-green deployment is and aren't DevOps? A handful of you. Cool. So the idea behind this, and this kind of started when I was at NBC. Uh, I'm no longer at NBC. Um, is, whoa, <laughs> terrible things happening. That's my VPN trying to log me in. Uh, is that it's safe to go outside. It's safe to move outside of your comfort zone. It's safe to go outside of Drupal to learn things. And in fact, going outside of your comfort zone, going outside of Drupal, going outside of PHP, you will learn a lot about how the web works, how different people build different things, and you can use it to improve how you work yourself. Now, to a lot of people, my internet is down. Why is my internet down? I need my GIFs. Sorry, I thought my internet was working. Clearly it's not. <laughs> and is it wireless? That's not going to work. That's not going to work. You went to the wrong network. Maximum number of supported devices. Uh-oh. This, this explains why my fonts didn't load. Because I got kicked off the internet because everyone else was on the internet. You said it was safe. It was safe. The internet, this internet's not safe.
There we go. So that's CNN. That's fonts. We should be good to go. Yay, we'll start over again. Now we're out. So for many people, this is what it looks like when images don't load. The internet's really slow here, Alex. Why is my internet so slow? It makes me not be able to make the points the way that I want to make my points. So it was safe to go outside, but clearly not because this internet isn't fast enough to let us go outside. Well, everybody just connect your connection so Sam can do his presentation. Please. Uh, so for a lot of people, the idea of going outside of our comfort zone, uh, trying Node if we're not, if we don't know JavaScript, trying Go, trying iOS development, it feels a lot like this, that, oh no, I'm going to get piled on by all these, these crazy animals. Uh, but you know what? It's, it's safe to go outside. It's OK. Leaving Drupal, leaving your comfort zone, means that you can learn stuff. And I'm sure that some of you are thinking, well, why did they bring someone in to kind of rickroll us uh, and kind of troll us during this conversation about Drupal? And I, it seems as if I'm not the only one who has done this so far tonight. So I'm kind of OK and in good company. Uh, but this is really what going outside is actually like. It's like going on an adventure. Uh, like I started to say before my GIF stopped working and we had to go log into everything again, uh, I started to leave Drupal well before I actually left Drupal. When I was at NBC, uh, Eric Duran, who left and he doesn't get his call out now, uh, or still does, but he doesn't get to hear it, he encouraged me to go play with Node.js. I'm a front-end developer. And through learning Node.js, my JavaScript skills kind of exploded and became really fantastic. And then I learned all about back-end development through Node.js and front-end development and improved my front-end development through playing with a friend of mine named Sam, coincidentally. Uh, I learned about Go, and I learned about object-oriented programming, which is not something I encountered as a JavaScript developer, because that's a different type of uh, paradigm. And I learned all these different ways of architecting websites. And I learned all these different ways of communicating and collaborating and, and working with different pieces of code that it really improved the way that I do work in whatever I'm most comfortable with, which today is JavaScript. But when I started down this path, it was PHP. And being able to explore these different things provided me with a way to figure out what I liked to do. Uh, when I first started, I was actually a back-end PHP developer. And that's probably funny to anyone who's had to see any Drupal backend code that I've written. Because uh, it's really terrible, but I really don't like writing backend PHP code, so it's kind of OK. I've been able to explore outside of Drupal. Leaving Drupal allowed me to find what I really love in development. And it kind of made me be this cool rock star with fire coming out of my guitar. This is how I feel now when I write code. It's, no, it's not like drudgy, boring, god, I hate my work kind of like what Jody was just talking about. It's really awesome. Every day I come in and I get to write code that I love in a language that I love, in a way that I love, because I left Drupal. I found something that I liked to do outside of this, this garden that we work in. Some people, there's a lot of talk about walled gardens. And there are some images about walled gardens tonight. Drupal in and of itself can be thought of as a walled garden. Uh, it's, it's its own thing. It's PHP. It's the Drupal modules. But it's hard to like break outside of that sometimes. And it's hard to learn outside of that, outside of that paradigm. And a lot of our thinking gets tied up in the paradigm that we use every day. So leaving Drupal lets us learn all sorts of different new things that we might not be otherwise exposed to that can help us work and turn us into these awesome, sparkly, shiny unicorns uh, that get cool shit done and are able to do cool shit that you probably didn't think you were capable of doing six months ago. So that's pretty much it. Stop using Drupal. Uh, my name's Sam. I am Snugug on the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Does anybody have a less than 10 second long question? All right. Cool. That's it. Thank you, Sam, our most ponytailed speaker the this most evening. Most ponytailed speaker. Um, our next speaker is the speaker with the name that sounds most like a character from an 80s horror film. Um, Mike Myers, how are you? Um, I'm definitely not reading this whole thing. 
Look at the bio that I was given. It it's was like, like 12 short, paragraphs what, what long. What are you talking about? I gave you a short one. Mike Myers is an Emmy-nominated technologist and entrepreneur with over 17 years of experience managing and leading local and globally distributed teams. His most recent startup, RHO Ventures, backed nowpublic.com, pioneered citizen journalism, user-generated content, and crowdsourcing. Uh, as CTO of the Clarity Group, which acquired Now Public in 2009, he led Examiner.com's migration to open source technology. Uh, he did a whole lot of other really cool stuff. And is there anything else you want me to say that I have to say right now? Because it, we're running out of time. Michael Myers, ladies and gentlemen. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. I know I'm standing between you guys and drinks, so I promise to get this in in less than 10 minutes with some questions. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Mike Myers. I'm the VP of Developer Relations at Acquia. And I want to talk to you about why Drupal is awesome and why you guys should be early adopters of Drupal 8. Great intro, Alex. I can skip this. All right. I've been with Drupal for a really long time. So over 400 organizations are already live with Drupal 8. Uh, anyone here launch a Drupal 8 website already? All right. I, I know there's a few. Memorial Sloan Kettering, phase two. Um, there are a lot more in development. Who here is in the process of developing a Drupal 8 website? Awesome. All right. Cool. So what I want to talk to the rest of you guys about is why you should be developing on and learning Drupal 8 today. If your websites are sitting comfortably on Drupal 7, you're probably not considering a migration to Drupal 8. And why would you, right? Um, you know, Drupal 8 is a stable platform. It's going to be supported for years to come. It meets most of your needs. Well. You know, I want to tell you why you should disrupt that, uh, and you should consider a new version of Drupal today. And the truth is that if you guys weren't already planning for and learning about Drupal 8, you're falling behind, right? It's not going to be an overnight success. You're not going to learn Drupal 8 tonight uh, or tomorrow. It's going to take you some time to get you know, familiar with these new tools. Um, and so the time to get started is now. There's definitely a risk versus reward, right? Uh, web projects, uh, they take a lot of investment. Uh, but there's a lot of advantages to being really early in the development release cycle that make the potential risks and any of the short-term pain well worth moving forward. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, when examiner.com bought my startup uh, and I started as a CTO there, uh, they were looking to get out from underneath a lot of legacy technology systems. It was holding the company's growth back. Um, and our big question was, you know, do we go with Drupal 6? a really stable and mature technology, or do we take a leap of faith and go with Drupal 7, which at the time wasn't even in an alpha state, right? Uh, and we chose to be bold. We chose to do Drupal 7, and it was a huge success for the company. And I want to talk to you about why we did it and why you guys should as well. Uh, first and foremost, with each release of Drupal, Drupal gets more exciting, more powerful, more easier to use, right? This is the most powerful, capable, and easiest to use version of Drupal ever. I'm going to tell you why different people are going to love it real quick. In less than two minutes, back-end developers are going to love that it's services-based. You can hook into a lot of different applications. It's based on modern CS practices. Sorry, Sam, but Drupal's getting really cool again. It's built on top of Symfony. Right? This is going to open an entirely new world of web applications that you can build with the same tools and technologies and teams. Therefore, you can do a lot more with the same people at your organization and the same tool set. It's integrated with the latest and best and greatest technologies and tools. You want to use the latest front end libraries? You want to use things outside of this wall garden that we're talking about back there? That's all available to you, and we encourage you to embrace it and use it. And this is what makes you awesome, is it integrates really well with all of these tools, technologies, and services. Designers and front end developers are going to love Drupal 8 as well. It's mobile first, responsive right out of the box. Your sites are going to work right on mobile. No work for you. Breakpoints, themes, images, HTML5, full support. Your users are going to love this, right? You fill out a form on your mobile device, it's going to work. It's going to work the way you expect it to. It's more approachable than ever. What we're trying to do is lower the barriers to entry. You heard a lot of criticism tonight about people that have been in the community for a really long time and some of the challenges they faced in using it. Well, that's what we're trying to eliminate with each version of Drupal. We strive to make it better. Drupal 7, you know, our theming layer in 8 using Twig really reduces that barrier to entry. So much more friendly to people that don't want to get into the technology. And a lot of developers are going to love the fact that we killed off support for IE 6, 7, and 8 at least. Or it's up to you what you do with Contrib. You can totally support it if you want. That's the beauty of a Drupal. You can live on your own. 
All right. Site builders will love the fact that it's totally mobile. Yeah, I'm going to pick on you this entire time. Uh, <laughs> No, it's my time. Well. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave 10 seconds for questions, and I'm going to ask someone else. <laughs> mobile administration, right? We talked about mobile browsing. You can also admin your entire site. You can site build. You can create content. Everything works on your mobile device the way you expect it to. If you're a site builder, you don't need developers. The curmudgeons in the back, right? You can point and click together a really capable, sophisticated, and amazing website. You need to add a date field with a date picker, you got it. You want email validation? We have that too. We're on sale today, folks. Um, <laughs> look, tons of great fields that you can drop in without being a developer. This is one of the things I love about Drupal 8. Views moved into core. What is views? Views is the ability to point and click your way to create pages that give you views into your data. With Drupal 8 and views being in core, you can create views into your administration site. You can use the back end tool here and you can create, here's my users that I want to administrate. You can create sidebar listings on your page, slideshows, and with the click of a button and zero code, you can export any of this in JavaScript, JSON, you know, XML, whatever. Content creators, people that use our websites are going to love the fact that it's easier than ever to use. We did tons of usability testing in labs and said, what's great about Drupal? What sucks? How do we make it better? We redesigned our content pages. We made it easier than ever to use them. We put WYSIWYG and all the things that you expect to come out of the box in the box with Core, right? So you can easily add photos. You can format your text. You can point and click. You can get true previews. You can see exactly what your content's going to look like. And then when you publish it and you make a mistake, you can quickly edit it without even having to go to an edit page with things like in-place editing. And in-place editing works for everything from bodies and title tags you know, to titles. Hundreds of features. I can keep on going. We simply don't have time. But the point is that Drupal 8 makes learning and doing things so much easier than ever. Right? With these pointing and clicking capabilities, you can enable more people in your organization to participate web development of your company. That's going to transform the speed at which you operate. It's going to re remove your reliance and uh, you know, your tight coupledness to developers. And for developers, it's going to mean that you get to focus on the things that are awesome, unique, and interesting to do with all these great new technologies. And your whole organization is going to move faster as a result. So yes, it requires some upfront time and investment and money to take on any new platform and to learn it. But I guarantee you that you're going to make your money back because your ability to execute is going to be so much quicker and faster. And so, you know, I experienced this at examiner.com. You know, with the latest version of Drupal, we were able to release features and outpace our old technology systems, even though we were building them out in parallel. And these new features and capabilities really grew our user base because it enabled our users to add more content. It enabled our internal staff and stakeholders to admin and use the site easier, right? And so, you know, uh, we went from having to deal with technical debt and trying to maintain and build on top of legacy systems to being able to really drive things forward with Drupal. And it's not that you can't do these things with Drupal 7. In fact, a lot of the awesomeness in Drupal 8 has been made available through the wonders of open source and backported and given to you today in Drupal 7. It's just that it's so much easier with Drupal 8. And I'll give you just a quick example. Drupal 7 powers some of the most capable, sophisticated, and largest multilingual websites in the world. The United Nations, the European Union, and European Commission have massive multilingual installations. And they're all doing it with Drupal 7, and they're happy, and they love it. But it takes 30 modules. With Drupal 8, you can translate all the things out of the box to zero work and effort. That's the difference, right? Another huge thing is incremental core updates. Drupal 8 has a new architecture and a new release model. Every six months, we're going to release updates to Drupal. These ongoing improvements are going to make it significantly better over time, right? It's just going to keep getting better and better. And so your investment in Drupal 8 is going to keep rewarding you and paying dividends. And so that kind of ROI, again, offsets any upfront investment in getting on board with a new technology today. People like Sam, who have contributed to Drupal 8, Ben Jevons, Eric Duran, who left earlier, They've helped create Drupal 8. They've been working on this for a year, two, three years in some cases. They're creating the best practices that millions of websites, thousands of organizations are going to be adopting in the coming year. Think about that. If you were to get engaged in this yourself, you're putting yourself at the forefront of technology. Do you want to follow people? Do you want to lead people? Do you want to shape best practices and have an opportunity to participate and make this grow? I suggest you put yourself in an advantageous leadership position, right? Drupal has the largest open source 
community in the world. We're clearly doing something right, and there is no barrier to entry. Anyone can jump in, anyone can get started and participate, and getting involved is going to accelerate your career uh, by an amazing trajectory. And at the very least, by adopting Drupal 8 now, you're going to differentiate yourself from competitors and give yourselves the upper hand because these people are sitting there with a wait and see mentality, and in a couple of months, they're going to be really behind. You're going to know actually how to use the tools that they're just reading about. Number one question I hear, I've heard it over 10 times tonight, how do I find amazing Drupal talent? Well, if you were to say, hey, look, we're doing Drupal 8, and we're going to let you contribute to open source projects in the process, I guarantee you'd have a lot of people that would be really interested in working to you. We did this at examiner.com, and I was able to hire I mean, like 15 of the top 50 developers in six months. Right? You need to approach talent in a way that's going to resonate with them, give them an opportunity to work on what is passion to them. So amazing benefits to get engaged early. The earlier you get in, the more benefits that you're going to get out of it. Um, it's going to enable you to execute faster um, and put you in a position to drive your technology forward. Right? That's one of the benefits of open source. It gives you the opportunity to get engaged and participate and help shape this technology. So being by, you know, in the driver's seat for Examiner was a huge advantage for us. Um, you know, we were committed to open source, and as I said, that really helped us enable a lot of talent. I'm beginning the one minute warning here, so I'm going to wrap up and say, look, there is no better time than now. When we launched Examiner on Drupal 7, it was more than six months before the official release of the platform. We are probably two, three months away from the official release of Drupal. It is a really great time for your organization to be considering it for building, and certainly if you are a developer, you should be learning it in earnest. Otherwise, you're going to find yourselves behind very quickly. So thank you guys for having me here tonight. Uh, any questions before drinks? All right. Thank you very much, Mike Myers. <laughs> Sorry, Sam. All right. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're running a little over, and we're going to get kicked out of the room real quick. So real, real fast. The next meetup is Wednesday, October 14th. That is not the first Wednesday in October. So mark that down in your brains. Wednesday, October 14th. It will be right here in this room once again. Um, make sure that you sign up on Meetup the way that you did this time. Make sure that you have your full name on the meetup.com uh, registration. Um, and... If you have ideas for talking, make sure you go talk to Ben Jevons. Bill's Bar is downstairs. If you go through the concourse, there's an entrance. There's also an entrance on 51st Street. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This was probably the, the most well-attended meetup we've had in quite a while. We hope we all come back next time. You good? Woo! Go team! This guy did most of the work setting this stuff up, so I'm happy to take all the credit for it. <laughs> Uh, we'll have a, um, we'll have a,